Hi, I'm Bobby, and welcome to The Steel Movies. There was a time in my life where I was really into the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And the opening line to the opening song was Michael Rennie was ill the day the Earth stood still. And if it was good enough for Dr. Frankenfurter, it was good enough for me. So I just had to see the day the Earth stood still. My reasons may have been strange, but it led me to seeing one of the most iconic and intelligent science fiction films ever made. The world of 1951, much like today's world, was a mess. World War II had recently ended, where we used the atomic bomb on Japan, so we now had the ability to destroy each other like we never could before. There was a Cold War going on between Russia and the United States, so we certainly didn't trust each other. The Korean War had started, and there was a Red Scare going on where people were being accused of being a communist. Producer Julian Blaustein, who was working at 20th Century Fox, wanted to make a film, and thought it was important to make a film, that said, we need to cut this nonsense out. We need to start behaving sensibly and have some peace in this world. Unfortunately, it wouldn't make a very entertaining movie, and 20th Century Fox probably wouldn't go for it. So he thought, why not tell this theme through a science fiction story? There had been some recent flying saucer scares, and adult science fiction magazines were in, so sci-fi would certainly be marketable. The Fox Story Department went through 200 science fiction novels and short stories, and then they found Farewell to the Master by Harry Bates. Julian Blaustein didn't like much of the story, but what he did like, he loved. Especially the part where the alien Klaatu is holding a present that would allow the president to learn about all the planets, but because the military doesn't know what it is, he's immediately shot at. Fox was known for an almost documentary style of filmmaking, and the day the Earth stood still would be as realistic as possible. In fact, the newscasters in the movie are played by real newscasters. Robert Wise was chosen to direct, and famed actor Spencer Tracy wanted to play the alien Klaatu. But Robert Wise felt that people wouldn't believe that such a big star was an alien. So the head of Fox, Daryl Fizanik, suggested the unknown British actor Michael Rennie, and a science fiction icon was born. As if things weren't strange there already, a flying saucer lands in Washington, D.C., and an alien named Klaatu and a robot named Gort come out of it. Klaatu is holding the gift, but is shot by a soldier. He is then brought to a hospital and says he has an important message, but will only say it once, and only in front of representatives from all nations of the world. He is told that this will be impossible, so without telling anyone, Klaatu leaves the hospital and gets a room at a boarding house. There he meets Helen Benson and her son Bobby. Bobby tells Klaatu that Professor Barnhart is the smartest person living. Klaatu goes to Professor Barnhart and tells him his concerns about Earth's use of nuclear weapons and warns him that if Earth people do not stop, their planet will be eliminated. The Day the Earth Stood Still was one of the first science fiction films of the era. And what sets it apart from so many that came after it is that it's part science fiction film, but also part human drama. There are great shots of the flying saucer. Famed architect Franklin Lloyd Wright actually helped design it, and inside and out is mysterious and out of this world. There is a futuristic and deadly robot named Gort, and there's an eerie music score created by famed composer Bernard Herrmann. He uses the instrument the theremin, and this became the main sound of 50s science fiction. So it hits all the beats that you want out of a 1950s sci-fi film, but most of the time is spent on the characters interacting. Klaatu interacts with government people, regular folk who are at the boarding house, he interacts with Professor Barnhart, who's supposed to be like Albert Einstein, and he interacts with the innocent little boy Bobby, who takes him to the Lincoln Memorial and to Arlington Cemetery to visit his father's grave. Did all of these people die in wars?
Most of them? Haven't you ever heard of Arlington Cemetery? I've been away for a long time. Is it different where you've been? Don't they have places like this? They have cemeteries, but not like this one. You see, they don't have any wars. Gee, that's a good idea. People named Bobby sure are smart. Now there are long stretches without much action, but because the film focuses on the characters, it has a greater emotional and intellectual depth. Also because they don't focus too much time on the ALIEN STUFF, when we do see it, it's more effective because it's able to retain an air of mystery. For example, we only go inside the spaceship a couple of times. But when we're there, we get the sense that there's more that we're not seeing, which is quite creepy indeed. While the film downplays the science fiction, Part of what makes it unforgettable is the alien. Klaatu, as brilliantly played by Michael Rennie, sets the tone for the movie with his intelligence and air of mystery. He's a diplomat for his planet, and he's here to tell the Earth to stop their nuclear weapons nonsense. He's kind-hearted, but is also not fooling around. It is no concern of ours how you run your own planet, but if you threaten to extend your violence, this Earth of yours will be reduced to a burned-out cinder. Choice is simple. Join us and live in peace, or pursue your present course and face obliteration. We'll be waiting for your answer. The decision rests with you. What makes Klaatu so fascinating is that he looks like a human, but he always has this otherworldly quality where you believe he's an alien. Part of this is Rennie's performance, with his English properness, aloofness, and occasional condescending attitude towards Earth people. But it's also the way he was filmed. Rennie was six foot four, and they capitalize on it. Except for the robot, he's almost always the tallest thing on screen. Also, he's very often filmed in the shadows, and he's often by himself in the frame. So very subtly, you always get the sense that he's different from everyone else. Adding to the otherworldly quality of Klaatu, the writer Edmund North added some Christ symbolism with the character. For example, you could see him as Earth's savior. Also, when he's interacting with the Earth people, he uses the last name Carpenter, which, according to the Christian faith, was Jesus' job. Now, you can interpret the character any way you want, but that's certainly another layer to the story. While the adult in you will be interested in Klaatu, your inner child will love Gort the Robot. Gort is part of an interstellar police force that destroys those who may cause harm to other planets. He accomplishes this with a beam that comes out of his head. Locke Martin plays Gort, and he was actually the doorman at Groman's Chinese Theater. And the reason they hired him was because he was the only person they knew who was tall enough. Gort was supposed to be 8 foot, and Martin was 7'7". Seven seven. Gort is a groovy looking and very foreboding looking robot. Unfortunately, Locke Martin wasn't a very strong man. So when he has to carry Patricia Neal, you can see the wires attached to her. Also, whenever Gort walks, you can see the wrinkles in the robot's suit. Now I hate to pick on the special effects of an old movie, but everything else is so sophisticated it sticks out. The rest of the cast is excellent, and each one brings something different to the film. And along with the characters making the film great, so does its social commentary. The movie's main political theme is we need to cut out the squabbling, start working together, or we're all gonna die. It's clear cut, but I like it, because it was a real world problem then, and it still is today. Go for the movie. The film explores how different countries and their people don't trust each other. Mrs. Barley doesn't even believe it's an alien. She thinks it's a Russian. Then the film goes even deeper and explains why this happens. It shows that instead of trying to learn or understand about something that's unfamiliar to us, we either destroy it, laugh at it, or just ignore it. Well, Mr. Carpenter, I suppose you're as scared as the rest of us. In a different way, perhaps. I am fearful when I see people substituting fear for reason. In fact, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Carpenter. I see another gentleman here in the crowd. The Day the Earth So Still was a last minute title that refers to a section of the film where Klaatu makes electricity stop. But you could read a double meaning into it. That we, the Earth, don't want to learn about this alien culture. We want to stand still and not change. The Day the Earth So Still was not without controversy. Not because of its peace message, but because of the casting of Sam Jaffe as Professor Barnhart. Jaffe was seen as a communist sympathizer and was blacklisted in Hollywood. It would be seven years until his next American movie. While the movie was a modest success, it developed an incredible cult following through its showings on television. 
Today it is recognized as a science fiction classic. It has been referenced and homaged countless times. In 2008, it was even remade with Keanu Reeves. If you're looking for a crazy action-packed sci-fi film, you'll be disappointed. But if you have an open mind, I think you'll find this to be very intelligent and very thought-provoking. So I give it three and a half Kalatu Barada Nikos out of four. Thank you for watching Dusty Old Movies, and please don't let the Earth be destroyed.